and Ozzy has told the press numerous times since then that Van Halen blew him off the stage every night. I grew up on Black Sabbath, but after Van Halen played, it was definitely a notch down. At that point, we knew that uh, we'd be headlining after that because we were blowing Sabbath off every night. But it was just a dream come true. They, they were finally touring the world for the first time. Their album went gold, then it went platinum. Eddie started winning awards for the Guitarist of the Year, and that never stopped. Finally, I, I remember slapping down the guitar player, man, guitar, guitarist of the year or whatever, finally saying, you see, I'm telling you the truth here. He's the best, okay? It's official now. Not only did Van Halen tear it up on stage, but off stage as well, as they quickly became known for their rowdy backstage shenanigans. When the second album came out, the back, you see the dedication, and uh, they dedicate it to the the Sheridan Hotel or the Sheridan Inn, the seventh floor, Madison, Wisconsin, which is really kind of funny because they were there for three nights and they caused a lot of damage, <laughs> to say the least. I was at the Madison thing that they apologized for on the second album, you know, thanks to the Madison Hotel or whatever, because they just got out of control and were just throwing, Dave was throwing furniture out the window. I mean, it was like the eighth floor we were on or something. And I'm looking out the window in the snow and there's tables and chairs sticking out of the snow that he'd flung out of there. and. And Alex is going in everybody's room with the fire extinguisher, just doing their luggage all white and stuff. And, you know, it was fun. And, you know, my, I heard some great stories. Mike taping fish to the ceiling of hotel rooms for whoever the sound man to come in and just, you know, be ranked by the time they get back. <laughs> Played a few jokes, uh, harmless. Nothing, you know, that could have hurt anybody, except maybe your feelings. When the tour finally ground to a halt, the band's debut album had racked up over two million in sales. Building on the momentum, the band returned to the studio on December 10th, 1978, to begin recording Van Halen 2. Summertime party album, Hot Nurses, yeah. The material was so damn strong, it was so good. Like somebody get me a doctor. It didn't take long for Van Halen 2 to go platinum, fueling the frenzy for their headlining tour. Van Halen has returned! Yay! And we got all the way to top bill this year! But then in 79, that was the first time that they really felt like they really hit it big with they were the headlining band finally. And they did 90-minute shows that were a lot of it improv and a lot of it was just jamming that they haven't really done since. I had the privilege and I was lucky enough to be able to sit in the backstage right behind the drummer who had a big speaker with Edward's monitor. So I had Edward's guitar coming in one ear and Alex's drums coming in the other ear and it was almost like being in heaven. On March 26, 1980, Van Halen's third album, Women and Children First, hit record shops. It was 1980, and I had the uh, Women and Children First tape, and I popped in the Walkman, and I turned it on, and, and I just hear this electrifying sound. Almost like the guitar was talking to me. Like... My God, uh, you know, uh, and then the lyrics come in and the screams and the hollers and the whoops and the, the this and the that. It was, it was rock and roll. Van Halen supported the album with an arena tour and hired a new head of security to oversee the rising superstars. Blam! The door opens and I turn around and I see this guy with this long blonde hair adorned with jewelry and bracelets. So you have a security guy, huh? I said, yeah. He said, uh, what do you think about excessive amounts of drugs being used? I said, oh, I have no problem with that. And the second question was, well, what do you think about a lot of underage girls congregating and partying in a given area? I said, I, that's fine, I, I'm okay with that. And then he gets real close and he says, can you roller skate? I said, no, but I could learn. Ed Anderson had one of the toughest jobs on the whole tour. That was taking care of Dave Roth. 
Dave Roth was a handful to take care of. March 19, 1980, was our first show in Victoria, British Columbia. Uh, this is where uh, I experienced one of the wildest scenes I've ever, ever imagined to see. I mean, Van Halen, once they hit the stage and the kids were just off the hook, they were crazy. The, the lights and the sound and, and the screams, I've never heard a crowd yell so long without a break. Anderson was, was great at taking what could have been a possible problem and diverting it in another way before it even became an issue. He was the king. We were doing a commercial in, uh, in Rome and there was a mirror ball hanging over the stage. They rehearsed this thing about three or four times with the mirror ball way up top. Now, so Dave sees this and he knows that, okay, we're cool, you know, situation normal, everything's set. The director, at the last minute, decides to get creative. So he decides to drop the mirror ball about seven feet above the stage. When the lights come on, he'll just bring the mirror ball back up. Well, he drops the mirror ball. As the lights come on, Dave does a flying leap. Nose versus mirror ball. Guess who won? The beginning of 1981 was a busy time. The new record, Fair Warning, came out on April 11th. The guitar album, that was like uh, the guitarist's favorite Van Halen album, Fair Warning. It's the darkest album, the angriest album, and probably has the best guitar solo. Song. Later that month, Edward married actress Valerie Bertinelli. What is your response to everyone saying that you and your wife look alike? Well, why do you think you never see us together? <laughs> In fact, most of the guys would find marital bliss. But David Lee Roth remained, well, just a gigolo. Van Halen roadies would go around in the audience and give all the hot girls Van Halen passes. And they had a really good system going with the backstage passes. It was all Dave's idea, of course. He would give all the roadies the passes, and the roadies would write down their initials on the back of the pass. And the girl that, or girls that Dave ended up with that night, he would look on the back of the pass and see the roadie's signature or initials, and then uh, he would give that roadie a hundred bucks. You put your initials on the pass, you give it to the lady, if at the end of the night, Dave is having long, mean, meaningful discussions with this lady, you got paid $250. Right around there, 250 100 depends on the lady. We had this system to identify where a troublemaker was. Sector 7, row 9, there's a fight, whatever. Dave saw the system. He decided to use this for his own personal recreation tool. Dave would come over to me and he would dance over and say, uh, Sector 4, blonde hair, red top. The next thing I know, I'd give the pass to somebody, go out and slap it on her. Bang, she had a, she had a backstage pass. So th the system was a multifaceted system. It got a lot accomplished. On April 14th, 1982, Van Halen released their fifth album, Diver Down. It signals somewhat of a creative holding pattern for the band, with five of its 12 songs being covers, ranging from Dancing in the Street to Roy Rogers' Happy Trails. Diver Down was kind of Dave's album, and that's why Eddie doesn't like it that much, because a lot of fans think of it as the, the album with a lot of cover songs, or maybe five cover songs, and those were all great, and then there were seven originals that were great. But it was very Dave, you know, Dancing in the Streets, Pretty Woman. A lot of the songs are covered to on the album, and right there was that was like between Rob and Templeman. I mean, dancing in the streets. I think there were too many uh, too many inputs. Uh, there are songs that uh, basically Ed and I were not interested in doing. Uh, Ted wanted to look for a hit single. Uh, Roth was always on a, a weird tangent somewhere. I would have never put a song like Dancing in the Streets on that record. That's not Van Halen. In 1983, Edward and longtime engineer Don Landy began building 5150, a fully functioning recording studio.